Salut, you finally decided to show back up. I am at my darkest hour. I, I cannot take your case. You've come into my office with the prospect of what, uh, bringing me out of retirement? I'll do it for one cigarette. On y va. Dostoevsky, hold my cigarette. You have more need of it than I am. Okay, asked you. We are going to solve the murder of Aristides Leonides. <laughs> Killed. Murdered. Not stabbed, in fact. Poisoned. In reality, I knew you were coming, so I drew up the plans already. Agatha Christie will not best me thrice in a row. It, it won't happen. You heard it here first. We are going to solve. My eyebrows are on Adderall. We're going to solve Crooked House. This is our Bible for this week. We have our victim, Aristides. He's, he's dead. So Aristides came to London in 1884 and he started a restaurant. He opened up a restaurant, was very successful, became exorbitantly riche. His first wife died of pneumonia in 1905. Of his eight children, one of them died in infancy, two died in the war, one died in Australia. What did they doing in Australia? I don't know. And another in a motor accident. And the last one, a year or two ago. My thought is one of them's probably not dead. They're probably hiding off screen until Agatha Christie brings them back in and they're the actual culprits. Our man, Aristide, at like 84 years old, still very poppin' with the ladies. He remarried. He remarried a 24 year old. Definitely not for money on her part. Definitely not for money. Geriatric in the streets. Okay, but really, how does Crooked House begin? It starts with this random, the most basic man I've ever met. Now for these stock images, this one I really did just search basic white man, and this is who we got, and this is Charles. He wants to marry Sophia. Who is Sophia? Sophia is the granddaughter of Leonides, Aristides. Wait, Aristides, Leonides. His father works for Scotland Guard. He just wants to marry Sophia and get out, but now that there's a murder in her well-to-do family, their match cannot be matched. Sophia does believe her grandfather was killed. So why do we think that it was murder? Leonides had diabetes, so he had to take insulin, but the detective found that his insulin bottle was actually switched out with a poison known as Esserine, and it was his wife, Brenda, who gave him the injection. One of his sons, Philip, thinks that he took the wrong injection by accident because being 80 whatever, he has bad eyesight. Esserine was probably readily available in their house because it's commonly found in eye drops, which he did take anyway. And it would have been easy to switch out because they kept the insulin on a shelf in the medicine cupboards cabinet part of the house where you keep medicine that everyone had access to. There's no locks. By the way, a lot of these family members live together and they just, they just come and go. This family doesn't know anything about boundaries. I've gone to the trouble of drawing up a diorama of the house. Okay, here it is. Leonides and Brenda live at the top of the house. Where's my spoon? Then we have Rogers, who does live kind of on the same floor as them, who is Leonides' son. We'll get to them. We have Lawrence Brown, who is the tutor, who is also one of our main suspects, or at least the family suspects him, because Lawrence and Brenda are said to have been getting a little too close, huh? They've been getting a little too close. You know what I'm saying. Then we have Philip, also another one of Leonides' sons. He gets around. He's Nick Cannon. And his wife, Magda who is a famous actress, and they live the floor below him. How did they find out that their father was dead? The day of the murder, Rogers, who we have a picture of Mr. Rogers. I don't think Mr. Rogers would ever do it, although he would be the last person we would suspect. Rogers, the eldest son, was in the library. No, just kidding. Philip was in the library. Rogers came down screaming that his father was having a seizure. Philip then telephoned the doctor, ran upstairs, but his father died before the doctor came. Now, there's kind of a game of telephone going on because Rogers told Philip, but Brenda told Rogers. Rogers was kind of the last person to have spent time with his father before a seizure-like incident. Mr. Rogers, we're just gonna call him Mr. Rogers now. Mr. Rogers got home from work in London because he works at his father's catering company. Since he was given the chairman position, spent time with his father, went away to do Mr. Rogers thing. And Brenda comes downstairs screaming about the seizure. Leonides has a seizure. Brenda is like, oh my God, he's having a seizure. She goes and tells Rogers. Rogers goes and tells Philip. Weird thing is like, no one's helping him. They're all just telling each other it's happening. I feel like they should be running up to help him, but they're not. Perplexing. I've seen Knives Out. This is giving me Knives Out vibes because of the insulin thing, because of the bottle that's been switched out 
which is what happened. I don't know if Knives Out took inspiration from this Agatha Christie book. It could have. It's a file. Frightening. This is his second wife. At this point in her life, she's now 34, so I guess they've been married for 10 years. I can do math. Um, she's very close to the house tutor, like we've already mentioned, but she is respectable. The rest of the family doesn't get along with her. That She's like the evil stepmother, kind of, except she's not that evil. But everyone is saying they don't see very much of her. Some people are saying she's to be pitied, but the whole overall thing with Brenda is that she makes herself scarce. Probably off talking to all the managers. This is supposed to be like her man. This is Lawrence Brown. <laughs> Wait, why did he spell English like that? Famously, it is said of him that he does not have the guts. Does not have the guts to do it. He's very quiet, unassuming. He's a good tutor, um, but these two may or may not be together. We have Mr. Rogers, who we've already talked about. He is described as the kindest and most lovable person, but he has a really bad temper. His wife, Clemency, is currently like my favorite person in the novel. I think she's so cool. She's described as like a cold-blooded scientist. She's one of the only people who openly admits that she dislikes uh, Leonides. She had a first husband who also died, not really mysteriously, but then she married Rogers. And he describes her as the most wonderful wife ever. We have like the it couple of the house. If this was Big Brother or something like that, these these are the popular this is the popular group we have philip is that your name we have philip who's described as like smoking and not cigarette and then we have magda who is the actress who is very uh just all over the place she's kind of all over the place she doesn't seem to be all there and these are also the parents of sophia who is the person that our narrator charles wants to marry and that's as far as we've got so it's time to give you some theories. I did also forget to tell you about Miss Haversham. Her name is Miss de Havilland. She is the sister of his first wife, but she always loathed him. Um, she seems pretty chill. She's just like a lady in her 70s who lives in the house. She looked after the kids after the first wife died, and she's described as having a shrewd brain. So I really just want to read you the description of Crooked House. It's actually called Three Gables because it's so cool. The curious thing was that it had a strange air of being distorted, and I thought I knew why. It was the type, really, of a cottage. It was a cottage swollen out of all proportion. It was like looking at a country cottage through a gigantic magnifying glass. The slantwise beams, the half timbering, the gables. It was a little crooked house that had grown like a mushroom in the night. Agatha. Nice. Agatha, nice one. Our narrator appreciates as well the beauty of Philip the Delph. Let's not lie to each other. Let's not lie to each other. Detective Emma does not lie about these things. Okay, because certainly I was not prepared for this perfection of feature, the straight nose, the flawless line of jaw, the fair hair touched with gray that swept back from a well-shaped forehead. Looking at Philip Leonides, it seemed quite impossible that a murder could have been committed anywhere in his vicinity. Okay, Mr. Rogers, on the other hand, who's supposed to be kind, lovable, the nicest person ever, has a fit of temper against Brenda. He's probably the person who is most convinced of Brenda. I wanna to speak to the manager, Leonides, guilt. He says, do you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to strangle that woman with my own hands, grudging that dear old man a few extra years of life. If I had her here, yes, I'd wring her neck. Okay, so that's sus. I look like I'm the crazy director of too many Shakespeare plays. No one's really being suspicious. I feel like maybe even, because no one has a motive, right? Okay, this is the thing I didn't tell you. No one has a motive because Leonides was extremely rich, but he had already given so much of his money away to all of his children, to the tutor, to Brenda, to his grandchildren, that no one really benefited from killing him because they all had his money already. The whole family is rich. Our friend Brenda, his first wife, has admitted to giving him the injection of what she thought was insulin, but was actually Esserine. So she says that she gave him the injection. Um, however, it is remarked upon that like it's not very well hidden. Like that's really clumsy of her. If she just left the Esserine in the bottle, she could have switched them back out. So I'm thinking that maybe what she gave him really was insulin, but someone came in afterwards and switched them and then gave him the injection of Esserine, the poison, in the eye drops and then left it and took the bottle of empty insulin 
away and put it with the other empty bottles. So like someone came in after her and tried to frame her and maybe that person is relying on the fact that Brenda is, could potentially be viewed as being that clumsy as not thinking it all the way through. So maybe he was actually given two injections. Maybe he was given the insulin that he needed, but then after that, he was given the poison as well. Okay, so this really caught my eye. So they just interviewed Lawrence, the tutor, and he seems to be really not guilty. He's just very sensitive, not really the kind of person you suspect, but um, the chief inspector is like, well, he wouldn't have to do very much, just help a very old man out of the world in a comparatively painless manner. And the surgeon says, practically euthanasia. I feel like this is really relevant because, I mean, he was very old. Maybe he was suffering. Maybe he found out he was about to die anyway. Like maybe he had cancer or just something that he knew he was going to succumb to. So maybe, maybe he did it himself. Maybe he got someone to do it for him. Maybe, I don't know. I just feel like this is particularly indicative of something. I'm getting a vibe from this passage. Okay, listen, we have serious work to do. Can you help me or what? Just a second, I have to talk to my- I have to talk to my superior. It's still me. Can you tell? I have a disguise on. Our narrator doesn't think that Brenda or Lawrence the tutor did it. Sophia is being a little bit sus about Lawrence herself because because Charles, our narrator, comes back in and he's like, I don't see what, what any woman can see in Charles. He's just a coward. He didn't fight in the war. And Sophia's like, actually, he has a lot of sex appeal. Charles is like, excuse me? And Sophia's like, why do men always think that a caveman must necessarily be the only type of person attractive to the opposite sex? Maybe there's something going on between Sophia and Lawrence. Okay, so we've now met Josephine and Eustace, who are Sophia's brother and sister and the son and daughter of this couple. Um, they're quite the pair. These are the vibes they're giving me. Wednesday Adams for sure, and Sid from Toy Story for Eustace. They're kind of like the evil little gremlins roaming around the house, but Josephine is full of information and she's just told us a bucket load of things. Josephine is like the little secret keeper of the house and she's let us know that Rogers and Clemency, Mr. Rogers and his scientist wife were planning on going away. Like they had planned a trip abroad and they were about to be out of there. I think they were supposed to leave like the day after Leonides died. They weren't gonna tell anyone and they were just gonna leave a note for the father, for Leonides. Um, and Josephine says this is because she was listening at the door when Rogers and Mr. Leonides were talking and she says she heard something about how Rogers had been embezzling money from the company that he was made the chairman of. So obviously they didn't leave, they didn't tell anyone because now he's dead. However, Josephine also says that she has read love letters between Brenda and Lawrence, which kind of dispels both Brenda and Lawrence's claims that they're not together, that there isn't any relationship going on between them. But I think that even if Josephine like found love letters, I don't think they're actually between Brenda and Lawrence. I don't think they are. I think Sophia has a lot to hide and I think they might be between Sophia and Lawrence. Because Sophia's like, we can get married if the right person killed my grandfather. And I think like if Lawrence or if Lawrence and Brenda were working together and they did actually kill Leonides, which is what Sophia is convinced of, but I think that she wants to be convinced of that because then it'll mean that the person she was kind of in love with murdered her grandfather. She'll never be able to forgive him for that. And she can safely get with Charles, our narrator, who wants to marry her. Because obviously Sophia, it wouldn't be proper for Sophia to marry Lawrence. So the only way he can probably be safely removed from her life, from her heart, is if he is the murderer. Because Josephine is like, I've read the love letters, awfully soppy letters, but Lawrence is soppy. He was too frightened to fight in the war. He went into basements and stoked boilers. When the flying bombs went over here, he used to turn green, really green. It made us laugh a lot. Oh, hi. It's me, Detective Emma, on her off hours, on her lunch break. Stopping in to thank Milano for sponsoring today's video and making it possible because I used Milano, which is a creative space for organizing ideas of any kind, creativity, projects, anything you're working on, school, work, personal life, 
solving murders. I used Milano to create my board that I've been working on and showing you guys all video for organizing and moving around the moving parts of Crooked House. Think of when you are like maybe frantically studying and you have all the sticky notes on your wall or on a cork board and you want to move it, but it's kind of like iffy. You can't really do it. You don't want to erase things. You don't want to have to take it down. Milano is an online virtual space to do that. It's like a place with infinite walls to put as many sticky notes, as many ideas as you want, and you can move them all around seamlessly. So for example, you can see my Crooked House board. I just created this one as a mind map. Drag and drop everything so seamlessly, so easy. You can put things wherever you want. You can move things around. You can also share this with like colleagues. You can invite them to collaborate with you. I have a hundred built-in templates. My favorite thing about it is just definitely the flexibility of being able to move things wherever you want, resizing things, making them smaller. You can like change the color of things, which I think is really fun. You can make it like very aesthetic, like a little mood board or something. I'll be happy to know that Milano is absolutely free with no time limit. You can sign up using the link in the description box if you want and start your next creative project. So thank you so much to Milano and um, let's get back into using it and trying to solve this murder. This case is looking more and more like knives out. Like I'm not joking. We have the lawyer who comes in ready to read the will to the family now that Leonides has passed. So Philip the younger son writes to the lawyer whose name is Gateskill that he thinks the will is in the lawyer's possession. Roger, Mr. Rogers, the oldest son, says that Leonides signed the will and was sending it to Gateskill. The common theme throughout the case so far is that all the family member stories always match up with each other. They never deviate even slightly. Even in the way that, you know, Brenda saw that Leonides was having a seizure, she rushes to Rogers, Rogers goes to Philip or the other way around. Everyone gives the same account of the story that happened and they're doing it again with the will. It pops into everyone in the family's head that a year ago, Leonides gathered them all together for the reading of the will. Clemency, Roger's wife, says that Leonides signed it in front of everybody, like on the table, and also in front of two witnesses who weren't part of the family, two servants. Once again, everyone agrees. Flash forward back to the present, and the will is not signed. It was in Leonides' safe, so like he put it in his safe, unsigned. And the lawyer is like, that is the will. It's not a draft of the will. He sent me back the draft. It is the literal will that I sent him to sign that the whole family said that he signed and it's unsigned. Why is it unsigned? I think it's actually Leonides who's the one who didn't sign his own will. He's described as like being very clever, very powerful. I think he didn't want to give anyone in his family anything of his and I think he purposely signed something to make them believe that he was signing his will, but in reality, it wasn't so i think it's his own doing does this make any sense as to who murdered him no but we're gonna keep going okay so first of all charles goes immediately to the police with the information josephine has given him about the embezzling turns out josephine is to be believed because rogers immediately spills his guts that yes they were going on a trip but no he didn't embezzle money his stupidity had just sunk the company into the ground and that's the thing like leonides gives his children all these opportunities makes rogers the chairman of his catering company which is wildly successful and lucrative and all of his children are completely stupid and idiotic and they squander their opportunities and rogers by making the wrong decision time and time again has run the company into the ground and so leonides summons him and that is the conversation that rogers and leonides were having the morning or afternoon i guess afternoon right before leonides dies because leonides is like yo son i hear i gave you a small loan of a million dollars and you lost it all and Rogers is like, yes, I'm so sorry, I'm an idiot. Leonides is like, don't worry, I'll help you. I'll get the company back on its feet by giving you another small loan of a million dollars. So it turns out that he wasn't embezzling money and Leonides was in fact prepared to help Rogers. However, of course, Leonides dies literally like an hour and a half after he talks to Rogers. So maybe someone didn't want rogers or the company to get that money i still think it's leonides himself he doesn't want them to get the money like i think leonides is like doing all of these things being like yeah i'll help you out i'll help you out but i think deep down he hates his family i think he doesn't want to give them a penny i think he tricks them into thinking that he signed the will because the person who benefits most by not having a will like they're not being a will at all is brenda his second wife now there's no leads rogers motivation for killing his father is kind of 
gone, it's not on the charts. So Charles is going back to Crooked House as he's now calling it. Okay, I just started to read again and tiny thing, Charles just had a conversation with his father, the Scotland Yard man. And he's like, you'll know a murderer if like they try to talk to you because they can't talk and it's killing them that they can't talk. So they want to talk about, you know, something or go over the case. And immediately Charles is like, hi, Sophia, can I come back down to your crazy house where all your family members might be killers? And she's like, come as soon as you can. I shall go crazy if I can't talk to someone. I think that's a red herring though. I think Agatha Christie is just being clever and she's trying to fool me because she thinks that I'm not clever, but she has bested me twice. I just thought that was a really cool detail because immediately Sophia's like, I need to talk. I'm gonna go crazy if I can't talk. And Charles's father, one of the detectives was like, you'll know the murderer because they need to talk. Okay, something to add to the Leonides theory that he somehow did it himself. Like he committed his own murder, essentially. Um, Sophia said that they had all gathered around the table one day because Charles asked her like, who in the family knew about his eye drops, who knew that, you know, a dose of his eye drops would kill him. And she said, everyone knew because one day Josephine was like, hey, grandpa, why can't you drink eye drops? And Leonides was like, if Brenda were to make a mistake and inject eye drops into me one day instead of insulin, I suspect I should give a big gasp and go rather blue in the face and then die because my heart isn't very strong. So we must be careful that Brenda does not give me an injection of Esserine instead of insulin, mustn't we? What are the chances that he predicts his own death? And if it was Brenda, why would Brenda do exactly what Leonides said could happen or would lead to his death? Why would she do that? So I feel like at this point, he either orchestrated the whole thing like himself, like I said, or he knew someone was gonna do it and he let it happen. Everyone keeps making remarks about how much all of his children and grandchildren love him and about how he loves them all, but at the end, just as she's walking out of the room, she's like, oh, be careful of one-sided idolatry. I'm not really suspecting Rogers or Clemency, um, even though they're now bankrupt, they kind of just want to get away, they want to move to Barbados. Rogers was only um, helping the company or being the chairman of the company because he thought that's what his father wanted, but he's really like, He's just a country guy. He wants to pot around with his sheep and cows and stuff. And Sophia says about Clemency, I don't think Clemency will mind a bit if Roger loses all his money. I think she'll actually be rather pleased. She's got a queer kind of passion for not having things. So she's a minimalist. First of all, can I just say, I'm loving Crooked House so much. I think it's fantastic. I'm also really enjoying how it's more of like a family psychological, like f not family drama. It's just like, it's not that they all hate each other. It's that people keep saying they like each other too much and their affections are stifling them. Apparently Aristide Leonides, our victim, wanted everyone with him always. He always wanted people around him. He wanted the family to always be there. Um, and everyone loved him, worshiped him. He was such a cool person. And so they always felt like they had to do whatever he wanted. People keep making a lot of remarks about how much everyone just likes each other, how much they're all up in each other's business. Um, Miss de Havilland remarked that the family is like bindweed. Sophia just said that we're all a bit twisted and twining. Like they're all just so, they're not even one person anymore. She put it so gorgeously. This also means that my theory about Leonide, Leonides being the one to either like see this and break them up. He's the one who would do that, but if everyone's like, oh, he always wants everyone around him, it doesn't seem like he would be the person to make them all scatter by his death because it seems that his death is really the only thing that's gonna help every member of the family be independent because he's kind of the glue that holds them all together. Sophia says, I think it's this. We've always, all of us, lived too much in each other's pockets. We're all too fond of each other. We're not like some families where they all hate each other like poison. It's almost worse to live all tangled up in conflicting affections. I think that's what I mean when I said we all lived together in a little crooked house. I didn't mean that it was crooked in the dishonest sense. I think what I meant was that we hadn't been able to grow up independent, standing by ourselves, upright, we're all a bit twisted and twining. It seems to me that the motive for any one of them could have been like they just want to 
live their own life. They don't want to be so suffocated by like love and affection anymore, if that makes sense. So now it's like, who's the person of all of them that wanted independence? Sophia is kind of up there. Magda is up there because she's really excited, the actress, Sophia's mother, to get away to a house. Obviously, Clemency and Rogers want to get away. They want to go to Barbados. They don't want to be tied in with Leonides' life anymore. All of them want to get away. We just found out that Miss de Havilland, um, Leonides' first wife's sister, Magda says that she was in love with Leonides as well, and so she really hates Brenda. Um, so it's just like this twisted thing where like love is the poison. So much stuff has just happened. It turns out that I was right about the will because it's revealed that Aristides, Leonides, our man who's dead, actually did switch the wills himself. And he gave the one that he actually signed, like he literally wrote up his own will and then he shipped it off to an old friend from Greece because he's Greek. And then this old friend is supposed to mail the will to the lawyer when he finds out that Leonides has passed away. And so they finally get the real will. And it turns out that it's completely different from the one that Leonides read out loud to his family and apparently signed in front of them when in actuality, he like switched the papers himself points for me. So now we know where the missing will went, but immediately we get a call from Crooked House itself from Sophia and they're like, oh my god, Charles, everyone, please come down. Josephine has been knocked out. She's been taken to the hospital and no one knows if she's going to live or die because Josephine or Wednesday Adams was the one who knew everything so smart. She kept like a little black book. She was like, I'm the detective of this case. And obviously someone knew that and has now tried to do away with her because she knows secrets. So how did this come about? How did she get knocked out? Because now if we can find who did that to her, we kind of have a better idea of who might have also killed Leonides. So they literally set a booby trap for Josephine because Pretty much every day, Josephine would like swing back and forth on this door. She would like put her feet in the cat door and then she would like swing on the door. So someone, and this someone must have been short because they needed a chair to climb up and put like this huge marble door stop on top of the door so that when Josephine swung, it would fall and hit her and it knocked her out and that's what happened and they don't know if she's gonna live or not. So Sophia was the one who found her like sprawled on the ground, blood everywhere, and that was at 1.05 p.m. So someone needed to have put the door stopper up there. I think it must be someone who's short because it says that the door is a short one. Like our detective guy can reach up and touch the top of the door, but for probably a lot of the women or if there's any other short people, like children, they would have needed to stand on a chair and there was like dirty footprints on a chair in the in the shed where the door was. So someone needed to stand up there, someone short. Everyone, however, has an alibi. Sophia was apparently out on a walk. Sophia's being really sus. This is the other thing I didn't tell you. The real will that Leonides wrote and the one that's now come into fruition, like the real will that they now have, he leaves everything except for a little bit of money to Brenda. He leaves a little bit of money to Brenda and then he leaves everything else, his estate, all his property, all his cash to Sophia. The reason he says for doing this was that every family needs someone who's gonna bear the burden of that family, who's like clear-minded and able enough to do so. And he realizes that all his children are idiots and Sophia is the best of the family. So he's like, I'm gonna give it all to you and you need to make sure the family turns out okay. Last thing that happens is Charles is like, oh snap, I kind of let this happen. I was supposed to watch Josephine, but he runs into the attic where he last saw Josephine because she said that she was detecting up there and he finds the stack of letters that she was talking about because Josephine was like, you know what? Lawrence and Brenda, they have been writing love letters to each other and Charles finds this stack of letters that is extremely suspect. I'll just read you the excerpt from the letter because it's incredibly incriminating. It incriminates the wrong people because everyone is assuming that the person writing to Lawrence because the letter opens, oh Lawrence, my darling, my own dear love. Everyone's like, it's Brenda. It has to be Brenda. They all suspect that Brenda and Lawrence are together. But this to me, I know it's not Brenda. I know in my heart of hearts, it's not Brenda. I think Brenda is innocent. I do. Guilty of other things, but innocent of this. The letter says, It was wonderful last night when you quoted that verse of poetry. Aristide said, You read verse very well. He didn't guess what we were both feeling. He's been so good to me. I don't want him to suffer, but I don't really think that it can be any pleasure to live after you're 80. And there's this whole stack of letters, but they aren't signed by Brenda. To me, this does not sound at all 
like Brenda's voice, that sounds to me much more like Magda, um, although that doesn't really make any sense. And so it still feels to me like it's Sophia. It could be Sophia who are writing, who was writing those letters to Lawrence. The same sentiment was also expressed a few pages ago by Eustace. He's like, it's not fun to live after you're 80 years old, which is, you know, very ageist and whatnot. But that same sentiment is expressed in the letter to Lawrence. Where does he, he's an impressionable young boy. Where does he get that sentiment from? He could get it from someone he heard saying the same thing, which could be Magda, because he has to pick up that sentiment from somewhere. Like it's remarked upon that he's very impressionable. He gets ideas into his head and to see an idea repeated twice um, isn't a coincidence. Like one must have gotten it from the other and it must have been Eustace getting it from someone older than him who he looks up to, either his mom or his sister or someone else in the family, but it has to be, has to be a woman in this case. And the person writing it seems to know that he's gonna die. They say, we shall be glad that he never knew that he died happy unless it's not even alluding to the poisoning. It could just be that they don't want him to suffer knowing that like someone belonging to the rich family is in love with a tutor when that's not really accepted. Today, we finished this. I've slept on this case all night. Did I wake up with any new thoughts? No. Everyone is convinced that Lawrence Brown, our tutor, also look at how nice my board is coming along, was the one who set the booby trap. I, for a fact, no, that is not Lawrence Brown. Okay, serious question. If you have a mustache as fine as mine own, how do you eat? How do you drink? Ideas have come into my mind, so let's discuss. It turns out that Sophia knew that she was getting all of her grandfather's money, property, everything. Apparently, Leonides told Sophia that he was leaving her all her money about a fortnight, so I think that's two weeks, right? Before he died. So it turns out that like she has a motive and she kind of confesses this to Charles. She's like, oh my God, wait, I do have a motive. I knew he was leaving me all his money, which like, I guess, I guess it is. And she's also the one who told Charles that everything would be okay if only the right, if it was the right person who killed her grandfather, the right person. By the right person, I'm not sure anymore because Charles took it to mean that she was referring to the person not related, not in her family that would still make her family well-to-do and respectable so that they could get married in good standing. But I'm starting to think that the right person might have been someone to bring him out of life compassionately. Like I'm thinking it, I still think it wasn't really a murder. The arrest has been made now. The detective has decided to arrest both Lawrence and Brenda. He's decided that that's what was happening, that they were together and that they did it together, although it's totally, totally not them. Um, I still don't think they're lovers. I think it's definitely Lawrence, but it's definitely not Brenda. Lawrence was writing letters to someone, and I really think it might have been Sophia. Sophia's first move as head of the family now was to fire Lawrence. I'm also starting to think that he's not as much of a coward as he keeps professing and as everyone keeps professing because he didn't go to fight in the war. He didn't want to. He was just morally against it and instead he stayed with the family stoking boilers and i forget who says stoking boilers i think it's josephine but josephine also has been known to lie josephine's okay by the way she's recovered thank god we love josephine because she's the one who goes into the cistern like in the attic and finds where lawrence was hiding his letters she says the cistern was a rotten place to hide those letters i guessed at once when i saw lawrence coming out of there one day i mean he's not a useful kind of man who does things with ball taps or pipes or fuses so I I knew he must be hiding something. And Charles listening to this is like, wait, but I thought, and then he gets cut off. And I think what he was gonna say is, but I thought he stoked the boilers and like worked with pipes and whatever during the war, that's what he was doing. But maybe he wasn't, maybe he stayed behind from the war because he couldn't leave his lover. I don't know. There's not that many pages left. So I am gonna have to stop soon and give you my final theory. But like Crooked House has, much less like clues I'm finding. It's much, much less about clues and more definitely about family and everyone's like private emotions, everyone's relationships to another. There's not really a lot of like, you know, 
things being left out or artifacts or objects or and very much discussion of room dimensions or anything like that that is so populated in other Agatha Christie stories so this one is really really interesting and I think that in itself is a clue that like it is about um family ties okay there's also the really weird fact at the beginning like literally on chapter two of the book that when Charles finds out about Leonidas death he does so because he's reading the obituaries but two are posted like two separate ones that are just a little bit strange so we have one that says on september 19th at three gables swinley dean aristide leonides beloved husband of brenda leonides in his 88th year deeply regret it and there was another one but then the other one below just says leonides suddenly at his residence three gables swinley dean aristide leonides deeply mourned by his loving children and grandchildren flowers to saint eldred's church so like i feel if he did have some foreknowledge i I'm assuming he must have written his own obituary, and I think the one that he would have written was the first one about Brenda, because I think like him and Brenda really did have a loving marriage. That's kind of been what I've been reading, um, or what I've been feeling about it, and then the next one must have been the family. He says there seemed to have been some faulty staff work resulting in overlapping, like having two different obituaries, but like why, why would someone write one? So much has happened. Um, first of all, ignore the, um, watching the Italian Grand Prix on the side. It's good, good for detective work. I'm thinking Margot Robbie and the tutor might be together because Philip isn't really striking me as the greatest husband. They should really do something like this. The letters that we have got to read are kind of giving me her voice. Like they're very dramatic, very lofty and stuff like that. Kind of like an actress's love letters. And as well, she does make reference that the woman writing the letters is married. Like, so the thing with the letters is that they're addressed to Lawrence. So we know someone is in love with Lawrence, but we don't know who because we never get to read Lawrence's letters. I'm guessing they've been destroyed. Um, and I'm thinking it has to be Magda or Sophia, but we know that the woman is married. So it's either Magda or Clemency or Brenda. I think their little love affair is going on, not really connected to the murder, even though Magda's letters, I'm assuming, do say that she will be glad when Leonides dies, possibly just so she can get some money and like go away with Lawrence, perhaps? I don't know. You think that they've caught the killer, but then Charles gets another phone call from Crooked House and they're like, oh my gosh, someone tried to poison Josephine, but it didn't work and now our nanny is dead. The nanny has been a servant staying in the house. She accidentally drank the hot cocoa that was supposed to be Josephine's and Josephine was like, I don't want it. And the nanny drank it and now the nanny has died. So we know that Lawrence and Brenda aren't the actual murderers. I feel like that was fairly obvious, but now it's like, who, who? I'm kind of leaning towards Miss de Havilland. I don't know. She was saying this thing, right? Cause Magda accused her of being in love with Leonides. And she was speaking earlier of like, be careful of one-sided idolatry. Um, so I feel like she might've been quite bitter about the new marriage and the love thing. Or I feel like she might've just been helping him out of life because she's also old and is a little sickly and kind of knows the struggles of living like that. It could have even been Josephine who killed her grandfather. It could have even been. I feel like the people I least suspect are Mr. Rogers and Clemency just because like they just want to leave and go abroad and just have a really minimal, um, simple life together. And I just feel like that's truly what they want. Aha, I am right on one thing. I haven't reached the end of the book yet or anything, but there are now spoilers, so skip. Don't watch anymore. Leave the video now if you don't want to get spoiled. Whew. Okay, so Edith, Aunt Edith, who is Miss de Havilland here, Aunt Edith, Miss de Havilland, um, takes Josephine, Wednesday, takes Josephine out in a car and she's like, we're gonna go get ice cream. Immediately I was like, yeah, the ice cream of death. What flavor ice cream would you like? Death? They're dead. They both died. Their car went off a cliff into the quarry and both passengers are dead. It turns out that my final two suspicions were correct, I guess, kind of, it's complicated. So what happened was that we have a letter from um, Miss de Havilland, Edith, that we find on the table that she addresses to the police. And it says, I take full responsibility for the murder of Leonides, as well as the murder of Nanny, the 
nanny but everyone's like why this doesn't make any sense and i'm like that doesn't really make any sense but i was kind of right with the whole like people are dying anyway the two elderly people in their 70s and late 80s were kind of already dying from something because it turns out that edith was about to pass away from something in a couple of months um she only had a couple months left to live and so she chose the way out of i guess taking her car off of the cliff with josephine in it why did she take josephine why did she drive josephine off the cliff with her it's because it's because josephine was the one who killed Leonides. I didn't really suspect her until the very end. We still don't know why, like we don't know why she did it. I thought my theory, I still don't know. I mean, it could be correct. The theory that like he wanted to die compassionately could be the thing, but we're gonna find out. And I still think, final guess now, I think it is Magda and Lawrence who are having the relationship. And if it's not, sorry. Okay, so it turns out that Josephine was the one who put the marble slab above herself and like almost killed herself just to make like a clue of it. Hmm. The motive is so uh, pitifully childish and inadequate. Grandfather wouldn't let me do ballet dancing, so I made up my mind I would kill him. Your grandfather doesn't let you be a ballet dancer. It's time to die. So everything's kind of being cleared up. It turns out that Aunt Edith took Josephine with her because she wanted to spare Josephine the blame of growing up. Kind of insane because this child is just straight up going around murdering people um, and also, you know, take away the pain of having to go to trial, of having, you know, her whole family hate her for killing family members like she was planning to kill most of them. And then Charles, because Charles and Sophia, the two people who are gonna get married, maybe, um, they're the only ones who know the truth because Aunt Edith or Mr. Haviland leaves behind the letter saying that, you know, she's taking all the blame. She doesn't want the child in it. So everyone will think she murdered Josephine as well. And Charles is like, well, this is great. <laughs> You, Sophia, I took both her hands in mine, will marry me. Your girlfriend just found out that her younger sister is a murderer, just found out her younger sister's been murdered, finds out her aunt has killed her and her sister, finds out her aunt is dead, just had her childhood nanny slaughtered, and you're like, marriage. Charles, Charles, the timing, my man, Charles, no. We will go to Persia together and you will forget this. Your mother can put on plays and your father can buy more books and Eustace will soon go to a university. Don't worry about them anymore. Think of me. Maybe pit stop at therapy? I don't know. So that is that. Case closed. It turns out in the end, I was wrong about Magda and Lawrence. I guess it was Lawrence and Brenda the whole time. Um, I feel like that part wasn't really wrapped up nicely that like it was Lawrence and Brenda who were in love with each other. There is Crooked House. This one, I'm gonna say I got halfway because in the end i did suspect the two of them that like i guess kind of did it until the next one let me know which one i should try to solve next i'm gonna take this mustache off my face thank you for watching and stay sleuthy